every first we have this meeting every first Thursday of the month. Uh, and so this is the first Thursday. Uh, we welcome you to our meeting. Uh, I want to um, uh, ask you to, if this is your first time at attending the Justice Not Jails meeting, we ask that you put your name, uh, your contact information, uh, the organization, the congregation, affiliation uh, in the chat. We'd like to keep up with you uh, and uh, send you uh, input, uh, information of interest from time to time. But we promise that we won't bore you or overload you with unnecessary uh, emails or information. It's just a way that we can be in contact with each other and uh, collaborate uh, with each other around all of the issues uh, that we have common interest in. So again, I want to welcome you uh, tonight to our uh, Justice Not Jails uh, meeting. Uh, at this uh, point, we want to tell you a little bit about, more about our organization and Justice Not Jails. Uh, in case you're not familiar with us, uh, we're going to invite uh, Mr. Curtis uh, Yarbrough to come and to uh, tell you about who we are and uh, what we do. Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome once again to Justice Not Jails. I am just really pleased to greet everyone tonight. Uh, the uh, Interfaith Movement for Human Integrity is a statewide interfaith network of 200 congregations, 1,000 faith leaders, and 250 community partners working to end the criminalization of people of color in our immigration and incarceration systems. Interfaith Movement for Human Integrity's work in Los Angeles County is primarily carried out through our Justice Not Jails program, the JNJ, led by Reverend Dr. Lawrence Foy. JNJ regularly convenes the first Thursday of each month in an effort to mobilize and galvanize the faith leaders and community partners to engage in justice issues that secure and protect the humanity and intrinsic dignity of people impacted by the criminal legal system. Next slide there, Larry. Okay, we believe in a compassion for all people, seeing their wholeness rather than pieces of people. We believe that every person is sacred across bars and borders. We're dedicated to exposing the root causes of mass incarceration, immigration, and criminalization. We mobilize for a California where every person's full humanity and full participation is honored. We, we have the duty to prevent harm and uphold well being. We have the collective responsibility to end systems that do not respect the sacredness of life. Our faith compels us to center the experience of community members that are excuse me, that are most impacted by racism, xenophobia, and in solidarity pursuits of systemic change. We believe that people have the capacity to change and redemption is definitely possible. Sorry, in our faith values. Okay, so now we're gonna go back to spiritual centering and reflection and I'll give it back to Larry. Uh, thank you, uh, Curtis, uh, for sharing that. Uh, our practice is always uh, open up our meetings with spiritual uh, reflection uh, or prayer. And so tonight we want to open up with a brief uh, uh, reflection uh, and this prayer. I want to share this prayer with you. Uh, and um, let's uh, have uh, this moment of prayer. O creator of life who made us in your divine image, gaze upon the human family with compassion. May each one of us, may each one of us be healed from the fear, hatred and indifference that infects our hearts, wins us to behold one another's dignity. Move us life-given spirit to make amends and act in solidarity for those who suffer from oppression. May each one of us reach out to liberate those who are incarcerated, 
to reunite, reunite separated families and offer hospitality into our communities. Together, may it be so. Uh, the purpose of tonight's meeting, uh, we want to uplift the status of black immigrants and to bring awareness um, about the US government's racialized immigration policy and practices that systematically and disproportionately target persons of African descent for exclusion, detention and deportation from the US territories. We want to call upon you, each of you who have joined us tonight to become an active participant in halting the US government uh, maltreatment of black immigrants and immigrants of color. Uh, later on, you will uh, uh, have uh, be pre presented with several uh, opportunities uh, to uh, engage uh, in this movement and to take action uh, to uh, help uh, fight for the freedom uh, and dignity for uh, Black immigrants, but also all immigrants who wish to come to this country. Uh, quickly, I want to take a few seconds just, 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 to, just to frame the issue. And uh, tonight, we're certainly in for uh, a, a treat, I would call it, uh, because we have uh, some prominent uh, persons who's going to be sharing with us. Uh, we're going to hear some stories, uh, and then we're going to hear some actual facts about uh, then and now uh, as it relates to uh, Black immigrants. Heretofore, J and J's Justice Not Jails uh, work uh, in LA County uh, has primarily focused on the decarceration of LA County jails, uh, including uh, collaborating and partnering with other community-based organizations and faith-based organizations to uh, prevent the construction of any new jails throughout LA County. Uh, we've also uh, made a commitment to uh, working to uh, introduce alternative solutions uh, other than uh, prison or jails. And so we are uh, committed uh, to, and we have been committed to here in LA County, uh, trying to undo uh, the uh, mass incarceration of persons of color, particularly black and brown people, uh, due to the war on drugs, uh, which basically exploded the prison population, where now uh, the population uh, is, uh, the majority of the population of black, black and brown folk. The tough on crime uh, and the ensuing law and order uh, and prosecutorial efforts uh, of both, both federal and state and local uh, at the local level have resulted in this buildup uh, in mass incarceration. And so thus far, our efforts has been focused on that in LA County. When I first came to uh, Justice Not Jails as its coordinator, uh, there were uh, some of my uh, colleagues or early founders of the Justice Not Jails uh, in Los Angeles were concerned about uh, whether or not uh, efforts toward uh, ending mass incarceration, particularly as it relates to uh, Black people, that it would be uh, co-opted by our larger organization that is Interfaith Movement for Human Integrity, uh, work around immigration. Admittedly, I too uh, sort of shared that notion. Uh, but uh, that has never been the intention of interfaith movement for human integrity, because our work, and as we view uh, mass incarceration and immigration, that there's an intersectionality between mass incarceration and uh, immigration, and that they are both basically uh, driven by race or racism, uh, that is the effort to, for the dominant uh, culture or the status quo to maintain power. And so both uh, mass incarceration and immigration 
are basically driven by racialized policies, which has resulted in the criminalization of black and brown people. Due to our concern, and I would say generally concern of, and I speak for, uh, in, uh, from my observation, uh, from the uh, efforts of, of uh, African-American led organizations uh, and leaders, faith leaders, uh, our efforts have been primarily focused on uh, the mass incarceration, again, due to the overwhelming and disproportionately presence of uh, Black men and women uh, in our penal system. And because of that, uh, we pretty much have concluded or written off immigration, seeing it as an issue uh, for folks south of the border. And I think that it's been purposely uh, designed uh, by the status quo. Recent events, however, uh, surrounding the treatment of the Haitian immigrants by the US Border Patrol brought to the forefront that immigration is a black issue too. In fact, immigration has always been a black issue. This is not some new uh, revelation to me, nor it is, is it uh, some new revelation of some hidden truth that's all of a sudden been revealed to in the faith movement, the human integrity. Uh, our work has been involved with immigration has been involved in Northern California uh, and in Southern California, particularly in San Bernardino County, uh, uh, particularly in San, uh, San Bernardino County. IFHI has uh, not only, uh, IFHI, as I spoke, uh, spoke earlier, sees uh, mass incarceration and immigration uh, at, uh, at, uh, at intersectional level. Again, both are driven by racialized policy. And so tonight, uh, if you are not aware, or we're not aware that immigration is uh, an issue that affects black people. Then by the end of tonight's discussion, you will be convinced that immigration is also a black issue. And so our uh, pre presenters and our story persons tonight uh, is going to share with you uh, some information uh, that's going to be helpful and bring that to the fore. However, before we go to uh, our discussion, I want to say to you uh, and advise you to make sure that you put your, uh, your questions, any questions you have, put them in the chat uh, and uh, we will do our best to, to get to your questions uh, when the Q&A uh, starts. However, we want you to be uh, uh, respectful and allow our presenters uh, to present and then uh, we will offer time for the Q&A session. We will also ask you to, if you have any uh, comments, or if you have any insight uh, that you want to add to the discussion, uh, please also put those in the chat. Uh, uh, my colleagues will be able to see those. Uh, and uh, again, please remain um, attentive while uh, our presenters are presenting. Uh, and if they invite you to interact with them, uh, then please feel free uh, to do so. So we're going to move uh, right along into uh, tonight's uh, meeting. And so we're moving now, we want to have, uh, uh, we have two people who are going to share their stories. And these are real people with real stories. <laughs> and so our first presenter tonight is Mr. Charles Joseph. He's actually uh, a spiritual activist and resident for the Interfaith Movement for Human Integrity. And so Charles Joseph, welcome. Bula to all. Bula is good life greetings in uh, Fijian. My name is Charles Joseph. I'm the spiritual activist and uh, resident with Interfaith Movement for Human Integrity. I was in prison for 12 years 
And uh, upon my release, I sent to immigration where I spent 11 months. And right after being released from immigration, I spent 11 months again on house arrest. And I'm currently still fighting the system. And I have these modern day electronic shackles on my feet, you know. Um, so that was the quick breakdown of what I'm gonna talk about. Um, <clears throat> I never, you know, come into America. I came out here when I was 14. And I, I never understood what it was like racism, you know, what it means to be, to be melanin, to be dark, you know, the plight of a black man. I never understood none of these things. Till later on sitting in prison, and, and reflecting on the system and how unjust it was, you know, from high school, from me being a 4.0 GPA to getting in one fight with an individual, the individual gets suspended, yet I get expelled, even if I didn't start the fight, you know, from uh, sitting in a car where I didn't even drive the car to being charged with grand theft auto, even though the car was not moved. You know, and these things I realized later in life. And that's what the system does. You know, the system is, is, is racial. You know, they looked at me, they didn't ask where I was from or what. You know, I had melanin in my skin. They classified me as a black man and that was it. And I suffered, you know, I suffered for that. And uh, I went to juvenile hall, ended up in prison, like I stated for, for 12 years. I did some searching and, and transformed myself. Um, upon release from prison, prison is packed. Prison is packed with majority melanin, you know, dark skin, African descent, uh, people of, people, you know, uh, people from foreign countries, you know, people who are not white, they flood the prisons, it's majority. That's where the majority is, you know. Minorities are the majorities in prison. And even, uh, you know, I thought that was that was that was bad, but it's worse in immigration. You know, after being granted parole, um, ICE comes and snatches me up, you know. And I remember I was in the, I was in the holding tank, and I uh, changed up I'm in my gear, you know, first time, fresh, fresh fit. No more prison blues. I'm, I'm happy. I'm about to walk out this door. And here comes this dude, you know, in the, this uh, private security outfit. And he calls my name, say, Charles Joseph. I'm like, yeah, here. And I, I remember all, you know, all my brown brothers were in there. You know, my Mexican brothers were in the cell with me. And they kept saying, La Migra, La Migra, you know. And then the dude comes and calls my name. And they look at me. They're like, the Negro? Like, what? You know, why are you going to immigration, you know? And here I get cuffed up, you know, I get cuffed up, thrown in this, thrown in this van and uh, sent to Mesa Verde. I get to Mesa Verde and it's worse. You don't see not one white person in immigration. That just doesn't happen. You know, my whole stay there, it, uh, it was, that's what it is. You know, it's all minorities. You know, my brother's from Haiti, my brother's from, you know, Jamaica, uh, all over the world, you know, all over the world. And this is, this is not right, you know, all because we what, we wasn't, we wasn't born here, you know, all because exclusion, you know, and that just allows them to, to cage us to keep us caged in, even though we don't need to be. be. We don't need to be there for a civil matter. You know, I've fought and I was fortunate, you know, with the help of community support, with the help of a lot of people on this, on this Zoom screen right now. You know, I was fortunate. I was fortunate with their help and uh, the help of amazing attorneys that fought for me and gained my freedom and open the gates, open the floodgates for many more to come out. You know, uh, many of my brothers hit me up that were in there with me. 
And, you know, they're just, they feel so thankful. The day I got out, my Jamaican brother, uh, Claude Bent, he was in there for four years. I got out after 11 months in immigration detention. You know, I was fortunate fighting for 11 months and I was free. He was in there fighting for four years, you know, to be free. And he was finally free after four years. You know, it's just, it's, and, and he didn't need to be there. You know, he was elderly, he was over, close to 70. He didn't need to be there. He just got done serving his time in prison, paid his debt to society. And he didn't need to be there, but ICE kept him there for four years. Finally, he got released and he's out here fighting his case where he could have been doing the same thing this whole time, you know. Um, might be rambling on a little bit, uh, but it's, you know, when I, I want to say something like, I heard my brother Larry talk about immigration being not just about brown, you know, but being about, it's a black issue. Immigration is everyone's issue. It doesn't, I, you know, I feel like if immigration exists, it will continue to be an issue because somebody is being oppressed, you know? And if we don't end that system, then we are contributing to oppression, you know? Uh, we could get all the power, you know? And if we're on top, are we gonna continue this system of oppression? So I feel it shouldn't be about being about color. It's our, it's our as one, you know, as the people, we should come as community regardless, you know, and fight the system of oppression, this continuity of slavery. You know, I'm right now, this is modern day shackle. I have it on my, my ankle right now and I've had it for two years now and I'm still fighting to get it removed. And uh, maybe somebody wanna ask me a question or redirect me. <laughs> kind of spaced out there. But uh, much respect, you know, much love to all. And I, I definitely push oneness and the end to oppression, you know, and to, and to unjust, unjust. And there's one thing I continue to say is uh, there should not be any exclusion or exceptions to humane treatment. This is a bare minimum. We owe humanity, you know, we owe each other is to treat each other humanely. It's a bare minimum we owe everyone, you know, humankind. Thank you, uh, Charles. Does anyone have any questions for Charles? Are there any questions in the chat or? Oh, we have uh, Joanne, Joanne Russell. Ms. Joanne Russell, you want to go ahead and ask me a question. Evening, good evening. And I'm glad to see that you are outside of bars. Although you're not free yet, you're outside of bars. Um, but my question is, is that it, it, this patient thing really has got me and I'm glad to be part of this conversation today. You know, because we took too long to start talking about this as African-American people, in my view. but um, other um, cultures and nationalities, when they come, they have some kind of recourse. I know for like a lot of the Hispanics and the Latinos, they're setting up justice and lawyer um, avenues for them, you know, left and right. You know, they're advertising. Do we have any such structure? Because it sounds like you were just a victim after being victimized, after being victimized. It almost sounds like really modern day slavery. You know, you, they grabbed you, put you on a plantation as soon as you landed. And, you know, it's it, it hurts to hear that story. But do we have anything like that? You know, it's, it's, it's messed up, but colorism is real. You know, the melanin creates this, this feeling in certain individuals that, that, and then they continue this system, you know, the system of hate. And uh, so it is, you know, like I stated, my brother, you know, my brother Claude Bent was in there for four years, 
and you know he he was fighting and everybody else would get legal assistance and stuff and he would it would be difficult for him so to answer that question the answer is no you know personally in my when i was there maybe now there may be some 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 things coming up you know uh, they were central central legal when i was in mesa verde and uh, lisa lisa knox you know she's an amazing attorney and she would be the one that uh, you know we could talk to but um something specifically for no there's like i i didn't i didn't know of any and, and my brother claude didn't know of any you know so if there are some uh, my brother brother larry might uh i i think uh, uh later on uh we have uh, our uh guest presenters uh with uh, either reverend saul's uh maraki uh from uh, Baji, uh, the Black Alliance, or uh, Just Immigration, uh, they would be able to uh, provide us with that information. Uh, we'll hear from them shortly, and uh, then uh, they should be able to uh, give us some information about that. Thanks for your question, Ms. Russell. Good to see you, too. Haven't seen you in a while. <laughs> uh, Larry? Yeah. Before we Always in the struggle, though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, Mr. Uh, yeah, Curtis. Yeah, before we let uh, Charles go, uh, could, could Charles briefly, there's a question that's uh, pretty pertinent in the, uh, in the chat box. Uh, if he could just briefly uh, touch on and explain what he meant by immigration detention is not necessarily a civil matter. Can you clarify that for the audience? Definitely. So, you know, we have the criminal criminal justice system they call it there's no justice in it but the criminal system right and in order to get into the criminal system you have to commit a crime and then there's a court system and then you're sentenced to serve a time you know that's criminal matter that's criminal court uh, which is definitely criminal that whole system is criminal everybody that partakes in this <clears throat> but um so immigration is different Immigration is a civil matter. So imagine a, a lawsuit, a civil matter. Imagine you filed a lawsuit. And as soon as you file a lawsuit, they detain you and put you in a cage for the proceedings of that lawsuit till it comes to an till, till it comes to an end. And they keep you caged in there because they have discretion. And because you filed this suit, now they're going to put you in this cage and we'll play this thing out. While you're in the cage, you'll fight this lawsuit. So that's what is civil. It's civil. It's no criminal. It's no criminal offense. It's a civil matter. It's an immigration status. So I came to this country, green card holder, social security, passport, everything legit. But because I went to prison, they want to snatch everything from me. And now I become in this civil, my status changes. And because my status changes, now they cage me. Don't give me the opportunity to come out and fight it, get an attorney, talk to my community members. They cage me for the duration of my case till it resolves. Like I said, my brother Claude Bent was in there for four years. No crime committed, no sentence given, just held there because of ICE discretion, because they chose to hold him there and he stayed there until they said, until actually the federal judge looked at it and was like, wait a minute, this ain't right. And granted his release, you know, uh, that's what happened with me. Federal judge granted my release with community support, you know, an amazing group of attorneys. They made that happen. You know, uh, me and my brothers inside, we did hunger strikes. We did demonstrations on the yard to, to bring some light to what's happening. You know, the injustice that's happening. Like these people should, we're not, we shouldn't just be allowed to be caged just because somebody say, hey, cage him. Oh, he's a threat because they, they, I was granted parole, which meant 
I was releasable, mean, mean, which meant I was bondable, which meant I was able to reunite back to my community. But I says, no, he's a threat to this community. Even though my community fought for me, he's a, he's a threat. He's dangerous, he's a flight risk. Even though I'm trying to stay and they're trying to fly me out, I'm a flight, it, it makes no sense. But just because they said, cage him, they caged me, indefinite. Some people are caged for years years and and without a crime cause committed so that's what the civil civil part is thank you thank you so much brother thank you he has uh is uh has uh valerie joined us yet is there okay yes 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 Ari. hi right. everyone thank Good evening you. To great we're not gonna hear from uh valerie uh santi uh and uh, Valerie is, uh, where's your homeland at Valerie? You tell us about yourself. So I'm from Cameroon. So my name is uh, Valerie Sante, an asylum seeker from Cameroon. I'm 27 years of age. And at the age of 24, I had to uh, quickly run away from my country because of a civil war and a violence taking place back in home as a result of the marginalization of the English-speaking Cameroonians, which goes back right to the uh, colonial era. I did not want to leave the country, but because my life was being threatened by the French government, because I'm English-speaking, and then because I also voiced out my political opinion about the government having a president for over 39 years, so my life was threatened. I had to escape. I escaped from my country by plane from Cameroon to Ecuador. Then I traveled on foot by boat and public transport through Ecuador, Colombia, Panama, Costa Rica, Nicaragua, Honduras, El Salvador, Guatemala. Mm -hmm. Then I finally got to Mexico and to the Tijuana borders. This journey took me about six months and I had to spend about 15,000 on bribing a police officer in Cameroon to help me board a plane without being arrested because we have just one, two airports. We have two airports and they're all in the French zone, but I'm English, so I had to like make a way out. So I traveled through all those countries. I also used part of the money to bribe police officers in the foreign countries to get my way throughout. Then I was asked to stay in Mexico for four weeks because of the former President Donald Trump's policy that made with uh, the MPP program that immigrants had to wait in Mexico. After I finally got into the United States, I seeked asylum, I was put into the detention I was there for six weeks. I asked for asylum. Then I was released on a temporary, uh, I was released on bail, on bond, but it was a free bond. So I did not have to pay any money, but they gave me an ankle monitor, which I had to carry for six months. When I was able to cross over, I was hoping to go to court and ask for asylum and get my results, but instead, I was put into a detention for six weeks, yeah. But I was granted release on the 12th, 20th, 2019. Then since then, I've been struggling to get my work permit, which finally came about three weeks ago. Since then, I've been struggling and working with the interfaith movement. As an immigrant without a social security number and not being able to work legally, my greatest problem back then was fear of getting caught working. But right now I feel comfortable and I'm able to work. Thank you all. And that is my experience as an immigrant in the United States. Thank you for Valerie. Valerie, uh, there are questions for Valerie. Uh, 
we have no questions for Valerie, then maybe later on uh, when we uh, get through with our uh, presentation, we can have follow-up. We have time if uh, someone has thought, thought of a question they want to ask him or you know, one of our uh, panelists. Uh, then... David, Larry, did you, we acknowledge uh, 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 Joanne Russell uh, raised hand and we already acknowledged that. There's a raised hand there from Joanne Russell. It's off the screen now, so uh, it was there. I don't know if that was a question or, or what. I think it was a prior question. I think. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Deborah has a question about uh, can we explain the Pacific? Um, she just put it in the chat. Uh, can we explain the uh, Pacific difficulties for Black immigrants? That's for you, Valerie, if you want to share, if you want to share from your perspective, what you, what you witness, what do you think some of the specific challenges are? Like the challenge is like having to wait, not knowing how you are going to go about your entire case, like not having a lawyer, not having legal assistance. Just hoping for the Lord's mercy was something very horrible to me. I remember before I got in contact with the interfaith movement, I was out in Tracy and I was working in a ranch. Before I met Daniel, who brought me to the to New Bridges Presbyterian Church, which I now attend. Then from there, Pastor Helen introduced me to Reverend Deb. Then I got a lawyer, but I had already been in the country for about eight months without a lawyer. I had not applied for uh asylum but i applied for a work permit so when i had a lawyer things started opening up at a certain point i was homeless i had to stay in my car but i finally got housing for about eight months now thanks to the interfaith movement and the quakers the friends of the quakers and I was also introduced to food pantry resources like getting food. So there were days that I actually went hungry, but those are some of the challenges we face. And then not knowing what to do, like trying to transition, it's a completely different country and different system. So, but those are some of the challenges that black people will be facing out here. I just want to thank you so much, Valerie, because uh, I I want to thank you so much for telling that your story because your journey is so unimaginable, like how, you know, crossing all those countries that you've never been to before, you didn't speak the language, it's just really, really remarkable, the, the strength and perseverance that you had. And I, I know it was very difficult and I can't even imagine, but so I just really want to thank you. I want to thank you for continuing to speak and to share your story because it's so informative. And I know for many immigrants, it's something very fearful when you're when people's status, you know, you're still case is still not resolved. Your case is still not resolved. And so the, the willingness to speak and speak the truth about that um, in that limbo status that you're in. I just I, I just want to thank you on behalf of all of us. Of what a valuable gift that is. One other challenge we face is like the, the rate at which they push. My next, for example, my next court hearing is going to be in 2024. So having to wait all that long <laughs> is one of the challenges that we Black people face, Black immigrants face. Thank you, Valerie. Thank you. Uh, so um, we're going to move uh, to our uh, keynote presenters and uh, look forward to hearing from them. We will introduce you to uh, Reverend uh, Kevin Sauls, which is no stranger to most of us on this, who is no stranger to most of us on this, on this uh, call, this meeting. Uh, pastor Sauls, uh, Reverend Sauls is a former pastor of United, uh, of Holman United Methodist Church. And personally, I wish he was still there. <laughs> he certainly was a prophetic voice. I listened to uh, his sermons uh, Sunday after Sunday, long before I met him personally. 
And uh, I'm telling you that he is one of the best preachers I've ever heard. Uh, sound, and theological, and prophetic. And uh, uh, I said this to him uh, personally, and I'll say it to, uh, to all of you on this call. Uh, this is a great uh, representative of our faith, of the Christian faith. He's a great representative of religious leaders in Los Angeles and throughout the country. Um, and I won't uh, go into other, uh, any further about my feelings for him uh, uh, because I, I, was, I may offend somebody <laughs> who might be on this, <laughs> on this call. I, I don't want to do that. <laughs> But anyway, we have uh, uh, the Reverend Kevin Sauls, and uh, who we are, uh, as I said, the prophetic leader, uh, former pastor of uh, Homer United Methodist Church. Uh, and he is a co-founder uh, and board chair emeritus of the Black Alliance for Just Immigration, uh, better known as Baje. Uh, and uh, his colleague is uh, Meraki Amasid. Uh, I may be mispronounced the last name, uh, she's also with the Black Alliance for Just uh, Immigration, and she is the uh, Mutual Aid Associate, associate for Baji. And we want to welcome them uh, to uh, our gathering tonight, and then they're going to share with us uh, and talk about uh, the issue of uh, uh, Black, uh, anti-Black, anti-Blackness uh, and migration. Uh, then and now. So I turn it over to uh, Reverend Sauls and Marake. Thank you, thank you, thank you, uh, Reverend Foy. Really good to be here and uh, <clears throat> to share this platform with uh, my kin at the Interfaith Movement for uh, Human Integrity uh, and uh, the, uh, justice, the Justice Not Jails you know, uh, initiative and uh, uh, I've been a proud, you know, participant in this and continue to uh, be a, a, a supporter of it as well. So, uh, so glad to be here. Thanks for the invitation. And uh, I'm going to be brief so that uh, our leader here in Los Angeles, which is Meraki, you know, uh, for the Black Alliance for Just Immigration can, you know, uh, continue to provide some depth and breadth around you know, the fact that, you know, immigration is a black issue um, and it is inviting us into the ongoing work uh, around anti-blackness uh, and uh, anti-racism work and uh, anti-oppression, you know, uh, uh, that's, uh, that we need to deal with uh, around that. Let me uh, uh, start off by just uh, expressing my appreciation to our two brothers uh, who shared uh, and certainly, you know, your experience captures really um, why we are here you know, uh, tonight and, and, and looking forward to how we will uh, continue to see, you know, uh, uh, Valerie, that you, that you don't have to wait until 2024, you know, uh, and, and given what you've gone through, uh, uh, the challenge of course in Cameroon, you know, around Anglophone and Francophone and then, you know, um, uh, being here, and then, of course, the whole piece, you know, around the incarceration, you know, uh, uh, piece. Now, if I was a church, I would have, you know, say, uh, turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, oh, neighbor, uh, immigration is a black issue. And then I would say, turn the other way and say to your neighbor, neighbor, oh, neighbor, immigration is a black issue. And then I'll probably say, you know, uh, turn to the choir <laughs> or turn to me. But... We are not gonna, we're not going to do that, you know, uh, around that. Let me start off by just uh, uh, framing, you know, uh, the founding of Budgie. It, it, it was birthed, uh, of course, out of a lot of pain in uh, 2006 when I was in uh, Oakland, uh, California as the senior pastor of the Downs Memorial United Methodist Church. And... Uh, in 2006, if you will remember, there were massive, you know, uh, marches around, you know, uh, then the, uh, uh, the discriminatory, you know, uh, and, you know, uh, oppressive strategies around immigrants. 
Um, and as one who was born and raised in South Africa, you know, uh, I was basically, you know, uh, caught between, you know, uh, what was, you know, uh, happening. And, and I noticed, you know, uh, two painful um, things that took place that directly connected with me. Uh, one was the uh, appalling silence of African-Americans to what was going on around immigration uh, then. Uh, and I was pastoring an African-American congregation. Um, and so I had to hear all the reasons why, you know, um, um, uh, African-Americans wouldn't participate. Um, and then on the other hand, uh, so on the one and the appalling silence, right? On the other hand, the acute absence of black immigrants in that in these marches and in and in in in, 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 in in all of it. And so caught between the pain of all of that, uh, I uh, sought out some of my uh, African American, you know, uh, uh, and black immigrant colleagues that I've been working on, working with around a variety of issues in the Bay Area, which was you know, uh, HIV AIDS, whether it was, you know, uh, uh, Priority Africa Network or on African issues, um, as well as, you know, uh, working on, you know, um, uh, what was going on in Oakland around, you know, uh, 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 incarceration and, and, and violence, gun violence and all of that. Um, and also, you know, I talked with Reverend Phil Lawson, uh, who uh, is the co-founder and I basically just shared my pain with him, you know, uh, um, uh, and out of that pain, you know, came the realization uh, uh, around why the acute absence of black immigrants, you know, uh, on the one end and on the other hand, why the appalling silence, you know, of, you know, uh, African-Americans. And so uh, 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 as we work through that, and uh, basically realize, you know, uh, that uh, uh, if we are to get to know and understand, you know, what was uh, what's been going on in the United States historically, uh, uh, carcerality and anti-blackness uh, are in the very DNA uh, of uh, this country, and 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 we have to just realize that and come to terms you know, uh, with it. It starts with anti-blackness and to be able to uh, uh, enforce that, uh, you then have to build uh, a, uh, a system of carcerality or a prison industrial complex. And so we started making the connection between, you know, what immigrants were going through and what African-Americans, you know, uh, uh, were going through. Uh, and that was very, very, you know, uh, important for us, uh, but not just that, we then began to also realize uh, how black immigrants have been pushed into invisibility, you know, uh, uh, in the immigrant rights movement. So that meant that the issue, you know, uh, of a racialized, you know, challenge that we were facing, you know, uh, almost became, you know, uh, um, uh, invisible, you know, because of that. Uh, uh, and so consequently, you know, uh, the Black Alliance for Just Immigration in its birth, you know, basically came together, uh, organized and mobilized, you know, uh, believing that a thriving multiracial democracy requires racial, social, and economic justice for all African-Americans and Black immigrants. And together we are stronger and together we can fight better you know, in how, you know, uh, we can, you know, uh, uh, challenge and transform structural racism and systems of discrimination, you know, in, you know, uh, the United States. So Baji basically uh, uh, sought to position itself in, at that intersection. And I'm gonna ask that we show quickly, you know, I have just three slides that I wanna quickly show mm -hmm. uh, just to capture uh, tonight's theme, but also to see, 
you know, how he can frame, you know, uh, uh, what happened then and, you know, uh, what's going on, you know, right now. So whoever has the screen share, you can just put on the first um, um, uh, image for us, you know, uh, uh, that'll be very, very helpful. I don't know whether it's Meraki uh, or whether it's Reverend Ford. So if you, you know, uh, have that, that'll be great. There we go. So go back one, uh, 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 the previous one, Meraki. There we go. So if you look at this particular image, you will see this past Sunday, I hosted my podcast called Faith Without Borders. And, and the theme we discussed really captures uh, where we've been and where we are. Uh, and that is, you know, uh, that uh, anti-Blackness uh, 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 is integral to what's happening around migration at this very moment. Uh, and that's very, very important to realize and to see how we need to analyze these intersections while at the same time, organize resistance. Uh, and that's critical for us uh, if we are to move forward. And we had a powerful uh, conversation on Sunday with our partners, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, SEIU, seven, local 721, Baji, as well as Clergy for Black Lives, you know, uh, we were all present, you know, uh, uh, doing, you know, uh, this uh, particular work. And what's happening with Black migrants now, that this is 10 years in the making, and Maraki will probably share some of that because we've already seen how this uh, was going down, you know, uh, in, you know, uh, uh, um, um, in Tijuana. Uh, uh, during our, our trips down there. These four organizations have been going down to Tijuana, you know, uh, for the last, you know, uh, uh, three to five years, you know, uh, uh, to go and be with the migrants there, uh, uh, but particularly looking out for black migrants because you'll be amazed at the experience. So Valerie, Valerie skimmed over what black, what black migrants go through uh, uh, and the experience of anti-blackness in all of those countries that they have to go through. You see, uh, in, terms, in terms of that. And, um, uh, uh, and so uh, let's go to the next image. So uh, uh, this has been happening and it is happening right now, right? Uh, in the, the, uh, the Haitian Times, a powerful article by Gary Pierre Pierre, uh, where he talks about African Americans and Haitians sharing the same history or a similar history. These images, you know, are of you know border patrol agents on on, on horses and whips, right? Uh, is uh, stems directly, you know, from uh, what slave catchers used to do, you know, uh, with uh, our ancestors, you know, who were enslaved, you know, in this particular country. And I tell you. Even folk who didn't know anything about what was going on on the border, anything about Del Rio, anything about what our black migrants were experiencing, once they saw these images, there was a bridge, a bold bridge that took place, you know, uh, 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 and uh, and so here we are, you know, uh, in the midst of what's happening, you know, in Washington, D.C., you know, uh, the inaction, you know, uh, and this false sense of normalcy that's been created, you know, uh, by uh, uh, quickly moving folk out, the deportation uh, that's been going on, uh, uh, um, uh, and, and, and you'll hear Maraki talk about the demands, you know, uh, around this. It, it, it brings us to where we are right now. And the final image that I wanna show you know, uh, uh, just shows the geopolitical uh, uh, tentacles of anti-blackness, of uh, 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 anti-racism, you know, uh, 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 and oppression that's going on in terms of the collaboration of the U.S. with the Mexican government. Uh, government. Basically, the attempt is to see how we can push black migrants back by pushing you know, almost like the U.S. border to Colombia. So in cities like uh, uh, Tapachula, you know, uh, uh, and other cities, you know, BuzzFeed News had this article, you know, uh, where it shows what's happening in, you know, Mexico. 
And if you didn't know, Mexico now has started deportation flights from Mexico back, you know, uh, to you know uh, uh, Haiti. So our black migrants in general and our Haitians who fled the U.S. border are now facing nights of raids and terror in Mexico because of the collaboration, you know, uh, of the the Biden Harris administration is very important. I mentioned Harris intentionally because it's not just the Biden administration, it's the Biden Harris administration. You know, uh, 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 and our vice president uh, cannot uh, 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 make herself invisible uh, in the midst of all of this, especially, you know, after the reprehensible comments that she made after her visit, you know, uh, to you know, uh, uh, South America uh, uh, around it. So, so, so here we are, this thing is very complicated. Uh, it's very challenging, uh, but one thing I appreciate about the interfaith, you know, movement of human integrity is just this belief, you know, uh, in the sacredness of all human beings. This fight, you know, uh, uh, is a long haul fight. Uh, it's a strategic fight. Uh, we've signed up for it. We're in it together, uh, and we believe, you know, uh, that as we as we move forward, uh, we want to say to the current administration, you know, uh, that this has got to be resolved. You know, if not, uh, then maybe midterms should be off the table uh, because we are sick and tired of compromising with the lives of immigrants in general, but in particularly black immigrants. Have you ever seen a horse, a border patrol and a whip chasing other immigrants down that are coming to the US border? My response to that is hell no. Immigration is the black issue. And if we are serious about uh, fighting anti-blackness you know, uh, in the United States, then we have to uh, uh, say not just black lives matter, but all Black Lives Matter, not just all Black Lives Matter, but uh, uh, Black Immigrant right, Lives Matter as well. Uh, so thanks for the opportunity just to share that. You know, uh, uh, let me hand over to our leader here uh, in Los Angeles, uh, Meraki, you know, who's been doing an extraordinary job organizing all of us, you know, uh, in this uh, work uh, and to share with us, you know, where we are and, uh, and where we're heading especially what's coming next week. Maraki. Thank you so much, Reverend Sauls. And um, thank you everyone for having me here today um, and for sort of giving me the opportunity to speak on this a little bit. And I wanna particularly thank the two men who spoke and shared their stories with us. Thank you, Valerie. And thank you, Charles Joseph. I appreciate you both. Um, I want to start us off by just giving a little bit of statistics. So bear with me, I know it's 7.30 and, and folks are tired, um, but I'm gonna give us a little bit of uh, numbers to sort of give us um, some information um, that backs um, the stories that have been shared today in the context that Reverend Salt has given. Um, it should be noted that nearly 5 million black non-citizens live in the US. Um, what that means is um, of that's the number of people who are um, who do not have citizenship and are in the U.S. Right, and that makes up ten percent of the nation's black population. Um, of the of the amount of U.S. born people, right, of people born in the U.S. Um, or pe pardon me, of the uh, total amount of foreign born people in the U.S., approximately eight percent of that population is black. So that means we only make up about 8% of the population of people who um, were not born inside the US but currently live in the US. This is important to note because of that 8%, um, right, we, um, we know that more than one out of every five non-citizens um, facing deportation on criminal grounds is black. Um, what that means is 20% of immigrants um, facing deportations are black, but only 8% of, 
of non-immigrants or non-citizens in the U.S. are Black. That's problematic because when we go even further and start looking at um, the amount of Black immigrants that are deported on criminal grounds, it jumps to 75%, right? So over three-fourths of Black immigrants are being removed from this country on criminal grounds. That's what we mean when we say that there's an intersection between the criminal justice system and the immigration system. Um, the two are inherently linked and um, it's, it's showing so in, in black bodies that are being criminalized in, in both the immigration and criminal legal systems. Um, that's been shown by the stories that we've heard today, right? Charles Joseph started off with an interaction um, with local law enforcement and that interaction then led him into being transferred into ICE custody. It's the same thing that's happening to thousands upon thousands of black migrants in the US for years now. Um, and um, it's important to note that black immigrants in removal proceedings for criminal convictions have often lived in the US for long periods of time and have often established strong community ties, community ties in the meanwhile as well. Um, so again, you could be living in this country for 20, 30 years, have no incidents with the law enforcement whatsoever, and then one minor infraction like a traffic ticket, right, or um, having um, a physical altercation with someone in a bar or having a domestic violence incident um, can now lead you on a track to deportation. Um, simply because you've had an interaction with law enforcement, right? So we know that um, Black immigrants are criminalized and most of the time through initial contact with law enforcement. Um, and so um, it's important to note that Black immigrants are also more likely than nationals from any other region to be deported due to a criminal conviction. And again, um, we have lots of numbers in our um, in Baji's State of the Black Immigrant Report, which you can find on our website, um, you know, under our resources. Um, we have statistics and numbers that show you the different regions of people and how many of them are being removed for, for criminal convictions. Um, if we look at our siblings in Africa, right, in the continent, 51% are being removed for criminal convictions. And if we start looking even closer to um, more specific nations, we see that um, our, some of our, our Black diaspora nations, almost 99 to 100% of people being deported are due to criminal convictions. So we know that we're being, that policies and laws in the US are being used to particularly um, target and criminalize our Black um, immigrant populations. Um, also, once they've been um, inside the system of criminalization, we know, we know that one out of every five immigrants detained while facing deportation on criminal grounds is also black, right? So not only are you having um, initial contact and are being um, um, got, gone and put through the criminal justice system, but now you're also facing um, detention as well, which again, as Charles shared for us, is, is as some has described more, even more so horrific than um, prisons um, because of the low, low quality of care that are put into them and because these are mostly contracted out to corporations, right? Um, so I'm saying all of this to, to share, to, to really raise um, some questions for your own thoughts. Why is this the case, right? Why is immigration being so racialized? Um, and if we look at the history of it, we see that this happens primarily with black immigrant populations. We don't see the same restrictions being, um, being put out for um, non-black migrants and non-black um, asylum seekers that are seeking refuge in the US. Our Afghan brothers and sisters received resources, received resettlement um, support and our Haitian siblings are not being given the same treatment. Um, our Cameroonian siblings are not being given the same treatment. Our Ethiopian and Eritrean siblings are not being given the same treatment. We see that time and time again, it is black migrants and black diaspora nations that are not being thought of, that are not being considered. Um, so we know that this is an ongoing and intentional attack 
um, on Black immigrants and on Black people in general. Um, I, I want to um, also sort of point out that this is all very much so done intentionally through laws and policies, right? Um, some of the things that um, we have been making a lot of noise on these past few weeks and that you may have heard different words and buzzwords sort of about um, are things like Title 42 and metering and humanitarian parole. Um, when we talk about things, uh, MPP, like, um, uh, the, like um, um, our dear brother mentioned earlier, the, I'm sorry, Vern. Yes, okay, I lost your name, but our dear Valerie, brother, Valerie. Yeah, Valerie, thank you. Our dear brother Valerie shared earlier. It's these sort of policies that were put in by, yes, the Trump administration, but also the Biden, the Obama administration also being perpetuated by the Biden and Harris administration. We do say and emphasize and Harris because where is she? Where is she when it comes to protecting and standing up for black migrants? Um, and um, we, we look to these administrations to now revoke and, and put an end to the policies that were put in place in order to target our community members. And before I get too deep into calls to action, um, I, I do just wanna share um, what, those, what some of those policies look like. Um, one of them being um, Title 42. Um, we're calling on Biden administration and um, Mayorkas of DHS to immediately put an end to Title 42. Um, Title 42 is an order that's preventing asylum seekers from making their asylum claims in the U.S. Um, and it was um, a, an, an order that was put together by the Trump administration, something that has existed actually since um, has existed for years since 1944 in the Public Health Services Law, um, and it allows the government to prevent um, any introduction of well, prevent introduction of individuals into the U.S. Um, if there's a public health crisis, right? And what they're pretty much what they're essentially doing now is claiming that Haitian migrants entering the U.S. would be a public health threat to the U.S. If you ask me, the public health threat to the U.S. is the U.S. because they are refusing to um, to protect and and maintain any sort of safety for Haitian migrants and other Black asylum seekers, and are thus perpetuating the health crisis that exists in these refugee camps and back home where they're being deported to. Um, we also have um, so we've been asking and urging that the Biden administration revoke racist Title 42. Um, and further that the metering system that's being used to process asylum seekers at the US-Mexico border be immediately, um, be immediately put to an end because this is a system that was um, created during the Obama administration and pretty much um, it has it so that black migrants um, are given the ticket and told to wait their turn. And as again, Valerie mentioned, a lot of black migrants are being impacted by this because all they're doing is waiting. They're being forced to stay, stay at the border without a choice and to wait and wait and wait. Some wait for months, some wait for years to be called on and then told that they can potentially start the process of seeking asylum. So we call um, on the administration to also end that metering system and to grant humanitarian parole to all black asylum seekers at the US border. Um, it, it's a temporary measure, but humanitarian parole would allow all black asylum seekers to process their asylum claims on the US side of the border. And that would allow for them to not have to worry about being harassed by the Mexican police, right? Or be harassed by local gangs or be harassed by other refugees who do not like seeing black refugees in their refugee camps, right? Or their so-called their refugee camps. So that's an, an incredibly important and immediate action that needs to be taken as well, granting humanitarian parole to all black asylum seekers at the US-Mexico border. And finally, honoring international law, the principle of non-refoulement under international human rights law forbids a country that's receiving asylum seekers, in this case, the US, from sending people back to the country that they're fleeing. 
we need to be able to protect asylum seekers and protect particularly black asylum seekers. And we need to, um, we need to honor international law and stop the deportation, stop the expulsions of black migrants um, for this reason. Another thing that I wanna mention, I know we're running out of time, so I'll just be quick, but a, a policy that was recently killed by the Biden administration is California's AB 32. This is a state, li state law that was signed in 2019 and it would have banned private prisons and private immigrant detention centers in the state. But unfortunately on October 5th, um, just this week, the, the, Ninth, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals um, directed that the district court block California's AB 32. Um, so that's another policy that we're working on and um, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that now. Um, before getting into calls to action, I know um, Pastor Sauls wanted to share a few words before we get into that. But thank you. Okay, perhaps uh, Pastor Sauls has stepped away. But what we want to do right now, uh, and we're uh, we're going to have a Q and A, and uh, our executive director, the executive director, of the Interfaith Movement for Human Integrity, Reverend Deborah Lee, and uh, my colleague, uh, the regional uh, director for uh, Interfaith Movement of uh, Human Integrity. Uh, she's the regional director of uh, Northern California, um, Scala King. Uh, they are going to lead uh, the uh, Q and A. Gayla, do you, would you like to kick it off? Sure. Um, so yeah, if, if anybody has any questions, please put it in the chat. Thank you so much, Meraki and Reverend Saul for sharing your insight and your incredible insight um, from Baji's perspective. I did have a question. I was curious, um, given the way that Reverend Saul described the how Baji formed and I the acute he mentions the acute absence of black immigrants in the immigration movement and the appalling silence from the African American community. So I was wondering, Meraki, if you could speak to that now, since Baji's fi um, founding, that was what really called the need for that space. And how how are you feeling? Um, now within the immigrant rights movement as well as with the African American movement. Thank you for that question, Gayla. Um, I I'm feeling like there is a lot more work to be done, but a lot more potential. Um, and I think that the immigrant rights, I think the racial justice um, community has. Um, done a lot of waking up and as, as certainly I mean uh, I know I was quite young back when Baji was formed in 2006 but then I can't speak entirely on how it was then but I can say that now um, I've seen um, a lot of solidarity and a lot of um, acknowledgement and awareness of the the oneness that we are right because black immigrants are black people period and um, we've all have this shared trauma and shared history and shared experience in America and throughout the world. And so I do love seeing that that has become um, a lot more at the forefront of racial justice groups that I've seen and witnessed and, and been able to work with. And in terms of immigrant rights groups, there's a lot of work to be done. There's a lot of anti-Blackness to unpack, a lot of um, transphobia, a lot of um, uh, lack of awareness of intersections in terms of folks with disabilities. Um, it, it, there's, there's a lot of work to be done. <laughs> and um, I'm looking forward to seeing that change happening because I've, I've seen the potential and the hope that's there um, for um, our communities. And so I, I see there's a lot to be done on all ends, but there's um, work that's being done. And I want to highlight and appreciate that. Thank you for that question. Yeah, if I can just add to that, uh, 
the, the challenge continues <clears throat> uh, because we have to understand that uh, there is a very real um, sense of anti-Blackness within the immigrant rights movement in general, on the one hand, and on the other hand, um, you know, at, you know, uh, within, you know, the, um, within brown communities. Uh, and I say communities, you know, and part of that is because of how white supremacy and oppression uh, marginalization has has positioned itself, you know, uh, in terms of, you know, uh, um, anti-blackness, and so uh, that struggle continues, um, um, and 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 there is some acknowledgement. I've done some work with Chirla, you know, uh, uh, around anti-blackness uh, and 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 all of that, and uh, Maraki just got back from. Uh, uh, from from NIC, the National, you know, uh, Immigration Integration Conference that took place in Vegas. You know, even in that space, you still need to have a Black NIC, right? Because the uh, the space, you know, uh, just becomes feels uh, uh, sends a message of anti-blackness. You know, uh, and part of it is just how we approach the whole issue of immigration, right? And, 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 and all of that. You know, as Baji, we come from a perspective of liberation. We, we do not seek assimilation uh, because, you know, of uh, the integrity, the divine integrity we believe in the humanity of black people, right? In terms of that. So, um, um, so that place of intersection you know, uh, is, is critical, it's essential, uh, and it, um, uh, it creates visibility, uh, uh, it provides proximity. And so at that intersection of our mutual oppression, Budgie's vision is that uh, we, would act, we would acknowledge that, right? Uh, make a commitment to act on it, so that that intersection can become one of liberation. Does anyone have a question? Um, I I'll, I have one. Um, I'd love to hear your responses on or ask about what has been. What's the response or the invitation for the Black faith communities? on this question of, of black immigrants? How is the, are they, you know, is there a response and support? Are you seeing that or, and, and if not, like what, what, what is your invitation or call out for them? I can speak on this briefly, but I'm sure Reverend Sauls will have a lot more to say. Um, I, I see nothing but overwhelming support from our black faith leaders. Um, we work closely, I know we work closely with Reverend Sauls, with Pastor Q, um, you know, Pastor Smart of SCLC. We've had um, an incredible amount of support come um, locally in Los Angeles, throughout California, and I know nationally as well we've had support. So um, I think it's been an, an age-old tradition of understanding that there is a divine responsibility to protect um, black migrants. So I've, I've witnessed that beautifully. I think, you know, uh, for me, the, that invitation, Deborah, continues uh, when I, in both my congregations. Uh, uh, let me just say the three uh, congregations I've been in, uh, uh, they've been predominantly African-American but there's always been black immigrants, you know, uh, in those congregations. Jones United Methodist Church in uh, San Francisco, Downs United Methodist Church in Oakland, and Home United Methodist Church in Los Angeles. In fact, at, in, at Holman, you know, uh, we have met, we had members from about five African countries and members from about, you know, uh, five Caribbean countries, including you know, uh, Panama and Belize. Uh, so we were truly a black multiracial, multilingual, multinational, 
multi-ethnic you know, congregation. And so um, um, I think it all starts with you know, uh, reminding you know, folk how we are all inextricably linked you know, uh, in this single you know, uh, garment of, 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 of destiny that's called a beloved community. You know, uh, it is, uh, that's why one of Budgie's foundational goals is education. Uh, or, you know, as we say in liberation theology, conscientization. You see, because uh, uh, what this country uh, does very, very well, you know, uh, is to numb us, you know, uh, make us become indifferent um, uh, to uh, the pain, you know, of others, even if they look like us. Uh, and so we just, you know, um, uh, and as I talk with Reverend Lawson around, you know, uh, this, you know, uh, it was a very, very transformative experience for me. And so one of the slogans <laughs> that we came up with, you know, uh, uh, in terms of bridging with the African American church and community was, you know, that our goal is, you know, uh, to, you know, uh, fight the ongoing challenge uh, of the civil rights movement and connect that with the emerging challenge of the immigrant rights movement so that we can together form a global human rights movement. You see, uh, because we wanted to make sure uh, that it is not about us, it's not about us and them, right? You know, we have a common uh, uh, enemy, uh, uh, we have a common oppressor, we have a common, you know, uh, empire, and, um, uh, and we have to make sure that, uh, that we continue you know, uh, to build all bridges that can facilitate you know, our mutual freedom uh, in, in this country. And so, you know, uh, and that's basically, we, so we lean a lot on a prophetic um, uh, voice and movement within the black church you know, uh, that, that enabled us to do that. Uh, and we found that in several of our civil rights leaders, like Reverend Lawson, right? Phil Lawson and Reverend, you know, uh, uh, James Lawson, you see, you know, because they, they connected the dots. It wasn't an either or for them, it was a both end in terms of the work that they've been uh, called to do. So that work continues, of course, and um, um, uh, building continues, broadening of horizons continue, and hearing stories like we heard tonight taking folk you know, uh, to uh, the border, uh, as well as now amplifying these images that we've seen coming from the border you know, uh, is, 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 uh, is very, very powerful in terms of how we you know, um, uh, uh, let people you know, understand that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Thank you, Reverend Saul. And I think we have a question from Joanne. Good evening, Joanne Russell. And my organization is Let's Make It Happen. And one of my biggest champions was Dr. Uh, Cecil Murray, because I wrote, um, pinned Let's Make It Happen under his um, civic engagement program at USC. And the program is really actually based around helping people, help empowering people and the agencies that serve them with an emphasis on African-Americans. And one of the things that I'm currently working on is our communication. Because um, when this incident happened, I was just dumbfounded. And my first response really was to hit the social media and demand equity in immigration. I mean, that hit me like a ton of bricks. So it's not just, and then for the African-Americans, yes, we are, our communications, COVID showed that. We have a huge communication gap because I sat in circles and I talked to people. And I must say that uh, Baji came up a couple of times when we started looking for a solution. So, you know, I'm proud to be sitting here and all the things that you said, Pastor Saul, are contributing factors, you know, because one of the things that stunned me, like um, for, I'm a social change and research organization. So looking at statistics even for African-Americans is almost, you can't find because they're blending our numbers. 
but you can't blend our cultures and our experiences. So we have to be vigilant on quite a few fronts. So um, I am game for whatever you guys want to do. But one of my questions was, is I'd love to hear when you do um, come up with your um, call to action, is what action are we planning for um, Evening Inter for all of us, but particularly those on other coasts and in other time zones. When I reached out I'm to take here and asked um, Pastor yeah, Saul to join us tonight, mm -hmm. I knew that we needed his presence. Um, it is very important for us not only to make a financial support, but we are believers and we know that it is important for us to <laughs> okay, I think we I think we we got we got the sound under control. Go okay. ahead. Sorry. Because the, the other part that I would like to see, because yes, we definitely have to bring African Americans up to task because we're falling asleep on too many important issues that are critical. But I'd also like to hear how we're looking to work with other cultures, because especially with a large immigration population, they need to get behind this because just imagine if they were treated like our black. Uh, brothers and sisters were in America when they walked over or when they came or when they dropped their babies over the wall or when they were, you know, sitting in a bundle somewhere. They didn't have to experience that. So they should also have a place in calling for the human rights of all immigrants. That's all I want to say. Thank you so much, Joanne. I appreciate that question. Um, if I could just say that um, I think I think the call to action is to to just show up really and to show up and to follow the lead of those who are the most marginalized in this work in this community right um, we know that um, our Haitian siblings are calling for the same demand where we know that we are uplifting the demands um, of our Haitian and other Black asylum seekers when we demand that the Biden administration end Title 42, and when we demand that metering is, we put, put an end to the metering system, um, and when we ask for humanitarian parole and putting an end to deportations and expulsions. So when we ask for these things, we're uplifting their voices, and I think that's the main way that we can get our communities um, in support of Black migrants is to center the people who are asking, the center those who are being most oppressed and affected by the issue, um, and then showing up for them in the ways that they ask for you to show up for them. Um, of course, you can also get tapped into our National Week of Action that's happening next week. And um, if it's all right, I know we're at eight o'clock, I'd, I'd love to just sort of do a screen share and share those resources with you. Um, yeah. Okay. All right. Give me one second so I can pull it up. All right. And can can you see the screen? All right. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, I can't see the folks. Um, but yeah, follow our week of action. Um, our national week of action is from October 11th to the 17th. The 17th is um, the final day and the day of, uh, of um, uh, famous um, Haitian revolutionaries assassination day, right, Jean Jacques. And um, so that's the final day that we end and it's a day in which we commemorate his life and his legacy. He was horribly assassinated um, in order to, to show all Haitians and truly all black people that you should not fight for your own liberation because by in so doing, um, you will be inspiring others to also fight for their liberation, right? Um, so we ask you to join our National Week of Action and you can do that by tapping into our toolkit. Um, and I believe, um, um, let me stop the share now. Those are our demands, which I already shared with you. Um, but you can also tap in by using our toolkit um, for individuals, which is bit.ly slash urgent action for black, black migrants. I'm dropping that in the chat now. And then if you're an organization and your organization wants to be tapped into this work um, for this week, 
you can use our toolkit for partners who want to join us in this work. And that could mean creating your own action or uplifting some of our social media or using your contacts and your networks to urge elected officials to push the Biden administration to follow these demands um, or donate to black immigrant organizations or black immigrant bail funds um, that need the support of our, our brothers and sisters in this nation. Um, do what you can to just step up and come through for the black immigrant community. I hope that answered the question. And forgive me for my shameless self plug, Baji plug. Reverend Sauls, is there uh, uh, anything you want to add? I think he may have had to get, get off of the call. Uh, but anyway, uh, we've uh, pretty much come to the conclusion of uh, our meeting. I want to thank all of you for joining in, uh, for uh, listening and for engaging uh, our, uh, our presenters. Uh, and thank you for sharing your, your, your thoughts and making your comments. Uh, we hope that you would uh, indeed uh, participate in some activity and adhere to the call to action shared by Meraki and Reverend Sauls, and that you also reach out to Baji uh, to see how you can be a further assistance and how we can partner together uh, to advocate for uh, the human dignity and fair treatment of Black immigrants uh, as well. Uh, with that, uh, I think, uh, it's, uh, Pastor Miller, are you still online? Yes, I'm still here. All right. So uh, two things we want to do. Uh, uh, Deborah, you think we want to do both? I think it, I'd love to hear some closing prayer or reflection from Reverend Miller. That would be great. Uh, all right. So, okay, so uh, I've asked the uh, pastor of the Lincoln Memorial Congregation of Church, uh, who also served as my pastor, uh, the Reverend uh, Wendell Miller, uh to close us out in prayer and again my comments are thank you so much for joining us tonight uh next uh first thursday we're going to uh rejoin the conversation around reparations and we want you to be here to hear that uh that will be a wonderful conversation uh and so we invite you to come back you'll be hearing from us about that uh, as we prepare for that meeting uh in november uh reverend lee if you, if you have any comments uh, then after your comments, final comments, and then ask a little bit of closes and pray. Um, just want to thank all the speakers and our guests tonight. And just to say, you know, in addition to supporting the Week of Action for Black Migrants, I think what was emphasized tonight was the importance that we do advocacy that um, really cuts the funding that is going towards what's called enforcement, you know, but which, which is really the um, the militarization of the border, uh, the detention centers, and all the other forms of dehumanization that are taking place in our name there. So I think that's larger work that we're part of, and we hope that all of you will continue to join us in advocacy around the efforts to really um, change the way the priorities in this country are um, and reorient those dollars and those priorities into so many of the things that all of our communities need uh, to thrive. Uh, yeah, Pastor Miller, right quickly before you go, let me just acknowledge two people real quick. Good to see you, Donna Perkins. Uh, miss you. Uh, and uh, Pastor Chad Ricks, who uh, was my colleague uh, at the New Millennium Church. Uh, uh, Pastor Ricks is uh, in Los Angeles, from Los Angeles, but he's all the way somewhere in Arizona. He decided to tune in with us. So thank you, uh, Pastor Ricks. Thank each of you for joining in. So, uh, and thank you, Meraki. Uh, so, uh, uh, Pastor Miller, it's in your hand. All right. Thank you, Pastor Foy. Thank you, um, Reverend Lee, for, for having all of us having this forum. It's always enlightening uh, to be with you. Okay. I'm off mute. There we are. Um, let us pray. We're grateful, God, for this gathering of those present who are all bound together by compassion and the quest for justice. We are thankful what we have learned from our speakers, their anti-oppression work and uh, their personal experiences interfacing with immigration and carceral systems. We're thankful for their sharing 
for it has opened our eyes to the truth and reminded us of the power of our resilience and our faith. Now help us to not be silent in this moment and further re render invisible those who are just struggling for, questing for, longing for safety and wholeness. We pray this prayer in the name of all that is whole, all that is holy, and all that is loving. Amen. 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 Good night, everyone. That was beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Good night, everyone. Maraki, that was really great. That was so informative. So we'll share out those resources and that report that you mentioned too in the notes. I'll stop the recording. <laughs>